Hello all, just a quick announcement to let you know that uh, finally I have set up a Patreon for Voices of the Past. Uh, my name is David uh, and I run Voices of the Past. So if what you think the channel does is worthwhile, if you think it's important to hear the past through the words of the people who actually lived it and of course help preserve primary sources, please do head over to the Patreon. But for now, enjoy the video. Ragnar was the son of King Sigurd Ring and his first wife, Alfild. His father, when an old man, had fallen deeply in love with Alfsol, the daughter of King Alf of Jutland. Her brothers refused to give her in marriage to so old a man, and when they were defeated in battle by Sigurd Ring, they poisoned her rather than she should become his wife. The king thereupon had her corpse carried on board his ship, which he steered out into the open sea, and then plunged his sword into his heart, thus dying beside the body of his beloved Alfsol. Ragnar, therefore, although only 15 years of age, was now king. He was remarkable as well for his great beauty as for the dauntless courage which he always displayed when he went with his followers on marauding expeditions to foreign lands. On one of these expeditions, he landed on the coast of Norway and penetrated alone into the heart of the land. On gaining the summit of a hill, he threw himself on the soft turf to rest and to enjoy the beautiful landscape which spread itself out before his view. The green valley at his feet, the lake sparkling like diamonds in the sunshine, and the verdant meadows and cornfields. As he gazed, on this fair picture, his mind was filled with the idea that the wild and warlike life he had hitherto led was, after all, far less satisfactory than a life of peaceful, quiet happiness. As he thus pondered, he suddenly became aware that two hostile divisions of soldiers had entered the valley. Presently, their trumpets sounded, and they rode at one another full tilt with their shields raised. His surprise was great to perceive that one of the divisions was led by a beautiful woman who was mounted on a milk-white charger and dressed in silver armour, while her lovely raven locks, escaping from under her helmet, fell in rich profusion over her neck and shoulders. She rode before her soldiers, cheering them on, and fighting the enemy herself with sword and spear. Many fell beneath her strokes, but the enemy being too strong for her little band to resist, they were obliged to retreat. Not so the heroic maiden. Captivity or death threatened to be her doom, yet still she fought on with indomitable courage, her bright silver armour making her conspicuous wherever the battle was hottest. Ragnar, seeing that she stood in sore need of help, could no longer remain an inactive spectator of the scene, but, seizing his sword, he hastened to her side and fought desperately against the enemy. His sword made such havoc amongst the foe, and such numbers of their best warriors were slain, that at length those who were left were obliged to seek safety in flight. As soon as the battle was over, Ragnar straight away withdrew to his ship. There he learnt that the name of the soldier maid was Lagatha, that she ruled the surrounding country and dwelt in a beautiful place in the midst of her possessions. The following day he repaired thither, and was received by Lagatha with much joy and gratitude as her friend and deliverer. Ragnar remained a guest at the palace for three days, after which time, as he loved Lagatha dearly, he besought her to become his wife, to which she joyfully consented. Ragnar and Lagatha lived very happily together for some time. She was an excellent wife to him, but she refused to leave her own country for his, nor would she resign to him her rights as sovereign. 
Ragnar passed three peaceful years at her side, but at last the warlike spirit woke again within him, and when he heard that the Danish islands had rebelled against his rule and became independent, he parted from his wife, who could not bring herself to leave her peaceful home for a strange country, and set out for his own kingdom alone. In a very little while, he succeeded in putting down the rebels and proceeded to his palace at Hledra, covered with glory. One day, a stranger at his court showed him in a magic mirror a virgin of wonderful beauty. The king was so enchanted at the sight of her that he could hardly take his eyes from her face and declared that the man who could call such a treasure his own must be the happiest being on earth. Yes. Indeed, replied the stranger, thou sayest truly, for this noble maid is not only famous for her beauty, but also for her wisdom and goodness. Her father, Herod of East Gothland, asks her advice on all occasions, and if he follows it, his enterprises are always successful. Now, however, both he and his daughter are in great distress. Some time ago, two of his warriors presented him with a griffin's egg, which was part of the plunder which they had brought home with them from a foreign land. It was hatched at the king's orders by a swan, and a curious little winged serpent came out of it. He gave that little creature to his daughter, who put it in a golden cage and fed it with her own hands. It grew... However, so quickly that it was soon too large for the cage and even for the room, and now it surrounds the whole house in which the princess lives. The monster is still submissive to her, but he guards her with a jealous eye, nor will he allow her to leave the house or receive food from anyone but the man who daily brings him an ox for his meals. No one dares attempt to touch him, for his eyes are like flaming fire, his breath is deadly poison, and with his tail he can break the strongest oak tree as easily as if it were a reed. The king, therefore, in order to rid himself of this curse, has promised the hand of his daughter to whomever shall succeed in slaying the monster. Before Ragnar had heard the completion of this tale, he had determined to set out on the adventure himself. He lost no time in procuring a garment of thick wool and ox hide, which he steeped in tar, for he knew that through such a garment neither poison nor venom could penetrate. Accompanied by many warlike companions, he set out for East Gothland and landed on the coast not far from the king's castle. Wrapped in his tarred garment and armed with a mighty spear, he started for the princess's abode. There, surrounding the house with his huge body, he beheld the monster, apparently asleep. He attempted several times to stab him, but in vain his spear could not pierce the scales of the serpent, which were hard and smooth as steel. Presently the monster raised its huge body and tried to seize Ragnar in its jaws, hissing meanwhile with rage and spitting its deadly venom at him. But as it thus coiled itself about, Ragnar perceived an exposed spot under its throat, where the scales appeared to be soft, and at this spot he aimed his spear with all the strength he could muster. For a few moments, the creature writhed and turned in agony so that the house was shaken to its foundation, and then suddenly the great monster sank to the ground, dead. The princess, awakened by the noise, stepped to the window and beheld the victor clothed in his rude garments, but before she had time to look upon him more closely, he withdrew himself from her gaze. Herod, as soon as he received news of the event, ordered a proclamation to be made to the effect that the people should meet together in an assembly in order to decide whom the prize should be awarded to. On the appointed day, Ragnar took his place in the assembly, clothed in his tarred garments. 
At the command of the king, two heralds carried about among the men the point of the spear, which had been taken from the serpent's body, in order to discover who among them possessed the shaft to which it fitted. When Ragnar produced the same and fitted the point of the spear onto it, the king, taking him to be a poor man, exclaimed in astonishment, Ha! Thou leather garments! And who taught thee that clever thrust? Comest thou from the Biama country, that thou hast such an odour of pitch and tar about thee? At these words Ragnar dropped his disguise and stood in his royal attire before the assembled people. Ragnar! Ragnar! It is the king himself! cried a multitude of voices, and Herod, stepping down from his throne, embraced him, saying, Thou shalt in future be called Leather Garments, in remembrance of thy valour, and I will give thee the hand of my daughter in marriage. The king kept his word, and the princess Thora joyfully consented to become the wife of her brave deliverer. Nor had she ever any cause to regret her choice, for her husband was so devoted to her that he even gave up his marauding expeditions in order to remain at her side. Their happiness was augmented by the birth of two sons, Eric and Agnar. But fate suffers no perfect happiness to be on earth, and ere long Thora died in the arms of her disconsolate lord. And now... Peace and happiness fled from the palace, and sorrow and mourning reigned in their stead, for Ragnar was inconsolable for the loss of his wife. At length, one of the noblest of his warriors stepped before him and represented to him how it was that he was still young and in the prime of his life, and it was a sin for him to waste his best years in mourning for his departed queen. His words roused the sleeping ardour of the king, and soon he was once more tossing in his ship on the billowy ocean, where, amidst dangers and diverse adventures, he strove to forget his great sorrow. One day, landing on the coast of Norway, he sent his servants inland to prepare food and bake bread. After wandering about, they came to a lowly peasant's hut, and on entering, they found within it a cross, hideous old woman, sitting, cowering over the fire. They asked her to help them make the bread, but she excused herself on account of her great age. Just then a young peasant girl entered the cottage, and the men, on seeing her, stared at her with open mouths, and could not find words to address her, for they had never before seen so exquisitely lovely a woman. "'Yes, yes, that is my daughter,' croaked the old hag. "'See, Cracker, these men would make bread, and do not know how.' Without making any reply, the girl set about preparing the dough herself, and when she had put the loaves into the oven, she directed the men to watch them, as she had other work to do. But the man only had eyes for the beautiful girl, who, with wonderful adroitness, went about the cottage cleaning and putting everything to rights. In consequence of their negligence, some of the loaves were burnt, and when they returned on board the ship, they were scolded and punished for their carelessness. They declared, however, that the king himself would have been guilty of the same negligence had he endeavoured to watch the bread in the presence of such a beautiful maid. Their words aroused the curiosity of the king, and he gave orders that this wonderful maiden should be brought before him on board his vessel on the following morning. She was to come unattended, and yet not alone, naked and yet clothed, fasting and yet full. This strange command was given to Kraka, who accordingly appeared before the king the next day with a fisherman's net wrapped in folds about her and accompanied by a shepherd's dog. She had taken some of the juice of a leek so that she was neither fasting nor full. 
In just this way, she obeyed the command of the king to the letter. Ragnar was much impressed by her wisdom, but still more so by her wonderful beauty, her fair silken locks and blue eyes in which the light of heaven was reflected. He straightway offered to make her his queen, but she, having no great faith in the constancy of man, desired him to complete his voyage, and then, if he should still be of the same mind, to return to Norway and repeat his offer. The king submitted to the will of the peasant girl and departed. His devotion to her, however, was unchangeable, and immediately on his return from his voyage he fetched her from her peasant home and took her to his palace at Heledra as his bride, and there celebrated his marriage feast. Kraka bore her husband four sons, the eldest of whom, named Ivar, was very handsome and had strong, broad shoulders, but his lower limbs were so weak that he always had to be carried about. The other three sons were strong, healthy youths who awaited impatiently the time when they, like their half-brothers Eric and Agnar, should be permitted to go on distant voyages and return with rich plunder from foreign lands. Meanwhile, the people began to murmur and complain that a peasant girl had been set upon the throne, and the courtiers, who were as dissatisfied as the people, repeated these murmurings to the king. Ragnar, greatly displeased at these complaints, set out for Swithiod to pay a visit to his friend King Eystein. He was cordially welcomed at the court, and the daughter of the mighty king waited upon him herself, and filled his goblet with sparkling wine, and sat beside him at the board. Ragnar was enchanted as well by her beauty as by her conversation, and when the courtiers pointed out to him the advantage of an alliance with the princess, he allowed himself to be persuaded, and asked for the king's consent to his marriage with his daughter. This the king granted, and it was arranged that as soon as their betrothal had been solemnized, Ragnar should return home, and under some excuse, divorce his peasant wife. When he arrived at his palace at Heledra, Kraka came out as usual with a glad and smiling countenance to welcome him home. She seemed not to notice his cold greeting, but did her utmost to provide him with every possible comfort after his journey, and asked if he had brought any news. On his replying surlily that he had none to give, she informed him that she had heard a strange report about his best friend, that he had wished to divorce his rightful spouse in order to marry a king's daughter, and that the betrothal had already been solemnized. "'What knave informed thee of that?' cried Ragnar angrily. "'My chattering magpies,' she quietly replied. "'Thou knowest them, for they were present at King Eystein's court during thy stay there. Full of anxiety, I sent them after thee, and they brought me a faithful report of thy doings. If thou dost indeed intend to carry out thy plan, I will return to the peasant folk whom people believe to be my parents. They murdered my foster father, Hymir, and now thou wilt destroy the happiness of my life. Before you do anything rash, listen to me, and I will reveal to thee a secret. Know then that my name is not Krakar, but Aslog, for I am the daughter of King Sigurd the Dragon Slayer, who ranks as high over all the kings of the north as the sun ranks above the stars. My mother was Brynhild. When my father was foully and secretly murdered by his brothers-in-law, Gunnar and Hagen, the good Hymir, for fear of the murderers, bore me away in a harp from the unhappy land, and after wandering about for a long time, came to the peasant's hut in which you found me. The two inhabitants of the hut, thinking the harp contained great treasures, murdered my faithful protector in his sleep by night, but did not dare to make away with the child which they discovered in the place of the gold they had expected to find. Thus I grew up with them in the cottage. They allowed me to keep my mother's wedding ring, together with her picture and the letter which she wrote before her death. 
Here is the proof of my story. Kraka continued, producing the letter and the ring. And yet another token has Odin revealed to me. It shall be made manifest when our unborn babe shall behold the light of the world, for in his eye he shall have a mark like a tiny serpent. As she ceased speaking, she laid aside her royal jewels and turned to depart, but Ragnar, who stood shamefaced and abashed before the noble woman whose royal descent he now recognized, besought her to stay. She loved him so dearly that she could not withstand his entreaties, but remained with him, and in due time presented him with a little son, who bore on him the prophesied mark of distinction, and was therefore called Sigurd the Serpent-Eyed. Meanwhile, Eric and Agnar, the sons of Ragnar's first wife Thora, had made their name famous by their warlike deeds. They had opportunity of displaying their valour in the war which now broke out with King Eystein, who was enraged at Ragnar's rejection of his daughter. Eric and Agnar landed on the Swedish coast, but they both fell in the battle which ensued, for Eystein's host was too strong for them and their ranks were thrown into confusion by the enchanted bull which the king had ordered to be driven amongst them. When the news of their defeat and death reached Ragnar's court, his third son, Ivar, forthwith set out to avenge his brother's untimely end. No sooner was the battle opened, however, that the huge enchanted bull rushed bellowing as before amongst the soldiers, causing terror and confusion in the ranks. Ivar therefore lost no time in seizing his mighty bow and arrow, and taking aim at the monster, he pierced it through the heart so that it fell dead on the field. After this, the battle was easily won, Eystein himself being struck down while attempting to fly for his life. Ragnar's sons engaged in many other wars and piratical expeditions. Their combined forces conquered the rich town of Wilfersburg, after which they marched to Luna in Etruria. They found it strongly garrisoned, and therefore sent messengers into the town to say that they came with peaceful intentions merely to buy victuals, and that their captain, Hastings, who was sick to death, wished to be baptized and received into the Christian church. Delighted with this news, the inhabitants immediately opened communication with the strangers, and the holy ceremony of baptism was performed over the sick man, the governor of the town standing sponsor. A few days later, an emissary was sent to inform the inhabitants that Hastings was dead, and that his dying wish had been that his corpse might be allowed a resting place in the Christian church, to which he had bequeathed his riches, with the desire that the priest should annually say three masses for his soul. The messenger ended by declaring that if this was allowed to take place, it was his belief that the whole army, who intended unarmed to accompany the body of their leader to the grave, would consent to be baptized. The request was granted, on the day of the funeral, the church was so crowded by the clergy, nobles, and citizens of the town that there was hardly any room left for the Northmen. The requiem was solemnly chanted, the blessing was spoken, and the body of the departed soldier was just about to be lowered into the grave. When? The lid of the bier sprang open. The dead man rose up in his shroud with a drawn sword in his hand, with which he at once slew all who came within his reach. The rest of the soldiers likewise drew forth their arms, which they had kept concealed beneath their garments, and massacred without mercy the unarmed people who filled the church. They then rushed out into the streets, plundering and murdering wherever they went, and setting the town on fire. This was the strategy by which means the Northmen possessed themselves of the town of Luna. While his sons were engaged in these warlike expeditions, King Ragnar himself was not idle. He determined on an invasion of Britain in order to force King Ella to pay him tribute. For this purpose he had two new ships built, large enough to carry a great number of soldiers and with these he landed on the British coast. He devastated the country in a terrible manner and engaged in many bloody battles. 
but he never received any wound, for Aslog had woven him a magic garment through which neither shot nor sword could penetrate. One day his ships were driven by a storm into a Northumbrian bay, where they struck upon a rock and foundered. He, however, with many of his men and some arms, succeeded in gaining the shore. Here they soon encountered Ella's forces, but the brave soldier, nothing daunted, did not hesitate a moment, with his handful of followers, to commence the attack. He fought without flinching in the hottest part of the battle, but as his brave soldiers fell around him, he was at length surrounded by the enemy and taken prisoner. No one recognized him, and as he refused to answer any of the questions put to him, King Ella, in anger, ordered him to be thrown into a dungeon full of serpents. At first, Aslog's magic garment protected him from any hurt, but the guards, when they perceived this, deprived him of it, and he soon after succumbed to their venomous stings. Thus died brave King Ragnar, like a hero as he was, uttering neither cry nor complaint under his slow torture, but singing in rich, clear tones a dirge of the Northland.